Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. It's a great pleasure, actually a great emotion, to be able to host uh, at least part of the GPFI community here in Rome. In opening this symposium that concludes our work this year, I would like to thank for the incredible support uh, all member and participating countries and our implementing and affiliated partners. But first I have to thank my co-chair, Anna, a partner and an ally, and now also a friend, I must say, throughout this special venture. GPFI delivered a lot this difficult year, in this difficult year, and we will discuss today part of the results. These results are summarized in a menu of policy options, which will be discussed tomorrow. And the cover of the menu is actually the same picture that we wanted uh, for this conference and that you see on the program. Before giving the floor for a few words to Anna, let me first thank Her Majesty Queen Maxima of the Netherlands, uh, our honorary patron, for her constant encouragement to GPFI and especially in this difficult year. She has granted us the honor of her introductory speech today. But thanks also to Governor Visco for his support uh, to the GPFI and the Italian team in this year of the Italian presidency, for being here today as well with his speech, and to Minister Franco, who will be with us tomorrow. To Professor Rajan, who accepted our invitation for a keynote lecture, and to all the distinguished speakers uh, who I'm sure will make this symposium an exciting event. And Anna, the floor is yours, but let me remind everyone that the event is being recorded. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much, Magda, and uh, Your Majesty, Governor Visca, dear colleagues. Uh, it's an honor to be here today for me and co-chair GP5 together with Magda. And I would like, first of all, to thank Italian presidency, my co-chair Magda Bianca, all Italian team and the Bank of Italy for organizing all this work this year and organizing this event. There is old saying, all roads lead to Roma. And uh, even today, some roads are virtual, distant. But uh, I think that um, uh, there are so many different roads to decrease poverty, to improve uh, people's life in the world, and financial literacy for sure is one of key roads. Uh, GP5 was established uh, by G20 leaders already more than 10 years ago after the uh, global crisis of 2008. Decade later, we have again challenging time, and I think that this is real momentum now to help people, especially underserved, excluded, underprivileged, to make their life better through digital financial inclusion means. And I would like to thank again Her Majesty for all her support uh, for all these years, uh, support and leadership in GPFI and also wider uh, global financial inclusion community. And I would like to give the floor to Her Majesty Queen Maxima. Governor Fisco. GPFI co-chairs, ladies and gentlemen, it is really a pleasure to join you virtually today. And I'm delighted to see that some of you are able to be in Rome to reconnect and renew bonds in person, finally. Today, I would like to tell you about Isu Hassan. I met Isu in 2019 during a visit to Bangladesh. Three years before, she started to produce hair oil to sell to neighbors and friends. This hair oil was based on her grandmother's recipe, and it was an instant hit. However, to commercialize her home-based informal micro-business, she needed support. So she turned to a local fintech called ShopUp. Via ShopUp's app, Easy could quickly access credit based on her digital transactions. The company also supported her with back office and online administration. Furthermore, ShopUp helped Izu build digital and financial literacy skills with in-person and virtual training. Today, Izu has a booming business with four employees and bought a house for her parents. Now, 
Isa's story shows how inclusive technology-led innovations can present our best pathways to go beyond digital payments to other invaluable services, such as credit, savings and insurance. When offered responsibly, these solutions can create new opportunities, build financial health, empower the excluded and support an inclusive recovery. ISO is not alone. Over the last year, ShopUp saw double-digit growth in revenue. To assist the growing numbers of MSMEs in its digital ecosystem, ShopUp has partners with Bangladesh's largest manufacturers, producers and distributors to help smaller enterprises get access to better terms. And in September, the company raised the largest financing round ever for a fintech in Bangladesh. They hope to use this funding to provide tailored digital opportunities to the 4.5 million mom and pop stores across the country, the vast majority of which have no digital presence. This is merely a single example of one fintech and small enterprise, but it highlights the unique opportunity upon us, not only in emerging markets, but in advanced ones too. We can capitalize on innovation, not for innovation's sake, but to enable transformative opportunities that improve people's lives and lead to positive development like outcomes. Digitalization to support key sectors is crucial for building broad-based growth and development, including MSMEs and smallholder farmers. This is especially needed today. Although global economic activity continues to improve, it is evident that recovery from the COVID-19 crisis has been uneven. While incomes in most advanced economies are forecast to return near pre-pandemic levels next year, only one third of lower middle income countries are expected to make similar recoveries. The groups hurt the most by the pandemic have been the underserved, including women, informal workers, smallholder farmers, and the small businesses. Already with limited access to the digital economy and financial services prior to the crisis, they have disproportionately felt its lingering economic impact. Countries that had previously invested in digital public goods witnessed their worth when the pandemic hit. This includes foundation ID systems, connectivity, interoperable payment infrastructure, consumer protection policies, and digital and financial literacy. These key prerequisites enable the rapid rollout of social transfers, digital financial services, and supported a shift to online payments for goods and services. Yet, challenges need to be addressed. Digital risk from fraud, cybercrime and identity theft need to be mitigated. We should be vigilant that increased digitalization does not exacerbate the digital divide and other inequities, but instead addresses them. Digital financial literacy, as well as policies that protect MSMEs and consumers, will be key components to this. I do warmly welcome the work of the GPFI this year in developing a menu of policy options to help set a course towards a new, more digital and more inclusive financial normal. One that addresses the digital risks to consumers and small businesses. COVID-19 has reinforced the urgency of these policies. I hope governments, businesses and development champions will use this valuable resource. It will help us refocus our efforts to improve digital financial capabilities and protections for consumers and small businesses. Doing so will enable entrepreneurs like ISU to more effectively and safely grow their businesses and thrive in the future. As only patron of the G20 GPFI, I congratulate the Italian G20 presidency and the GPFI and its two co-chairs for organizing this week's plenary sessions, as well as a high quality of your work. I look forward 
to following your country's continued progress and cheering your accomplishments. Together, we can drive action to help us recover and build a more inclusive, resilient and responsible digital financial system with expanded opportunities for all. Thank you very much and good luck. Thank you very much, Your Majesty. And now I'm pleased to leave the floor to Mr. Ignazio Visco, Governor of Banca d'Italia, for his introductory remarks. Mr. Visco, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Magda. Your Majesty, distinguished speakers and participants, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. It is a real pleasure for me to welcome you today in the occasion of this special event, the high-level symposium of the Global Partnership for Financial Inclusion. We had hoped to welcome all of you in person, but that has not been possible, and we are necessarily becoming more accustomed to meeting in these hybrid formats. So I thank you all for joining us today and tomorrow, however you have been able to do. The symposium focuses on a very important topic, as new vulnerabilities brought about by the pandemic and by the consequent acceleration in the digitalization of services are amplifying the problems financial inclusion already faces from old vulnerabilities. The G20 this year has worked hard to address these issues. As the end of the Italian presidency is approaching, I'd like to briefly talk about the work done so far and what has already been achieved. We can claim a fair degree of success on a number of initiatives, even if many important issues still <clears throat> remain to be addressed and resolved, and on these matters, work will continue under the Indonesian presidency. In July, we endorsed the G20 menu of policy options on digital transformation and product productivity recovery, providing an overview of measures that can revive productivity gains with a particular focus on digital platforms, digital skills, and intangible assets. The menu will serve as a guide for effective policies and regulations to ensure that the benefits of digitalization and innovation are fully exploited and evenly shared. Successfully ensuring a balanced and inclusive recovery requires long-sightedness as to the challenges and opportunities raised both by pre-existing as well as newly emerging structural transformations. The digitalization of the economy, of finance, and of society at large, by no means a new phenomenon, but one that has been rapidly accelerated by the pandemic, is one of the most critical of these transformations. We must avoid it resulting in new forms of exclusion, and we must work to ensure that its benefits are widely shared. In particular, the shift towards digital financial services offers new opportunities, but if not effectively governed, also poses new threats. Unequal access to finance may deepen the divide for current and future generations. A positive outcome crucially depends on the development and accessibility of digital infrastructures. The degree of financial and digital literacy and the adequacy of governance, including in the fields of regulation and supervision. We should make the most of the lessons learned from the pandemic crisis and exploit them to bounce forward towards a more inclusive and resilient post-pandemic world. The common goal is to make sure that no one is left behind, contrasting both the risk of exclusion and that of irresponsible financial behavior, such as over indebtedness, exacerbated by the misleading ease of access to and even misguided use of digital financial services. We see two main complementary areas of intervention. One is raising digital and financial awareness and the competences of individuals and firms, delivering educational content also through digital means. 
<clears throat> this is an essential tool, essential for personal empowerment, active citizenship, financial inclusion, resilience, well-being. Households and businesses endowed with higher financial literacy will be better able to cope with the income strains they may have to face during crisis. Building up more substantial financial cushions in good times would make them better place to cover living expenses in more difficult ones and avoid needing to resort to heavy borrowing. The other area of intervention is fostering more innovative regulatory and supervisory approaches so as to steer and encourage the development of inclusive and responsible digital financial services while guaranteeing adequate protection to financial customers, not least from cyber risk. This must be done as we adapt to an environment in which the use of digital channels for accessing payment, investment and lending services is steadily growing. Under the Italian presidency, the GPFI has worked on a menu of policy options on the two complementary areas of financial consumer protection and financial education. The menu has distilled best practices and practical examples from countries' experiences during the pandemic that can best support the transformation towards a more inclusive financial system in a long-term perspective depending on individual country needs and circumstances. There are three main takeaways from the menu. The first is that when addressing the financial implications of such deep and pervasive economic crisis, policy actions must be taken keeping in mind their long-term consequences. This means that we need to be ready to recognize, implement and reinforce all the changes and best practices that will allow us to make permanent progress. The pandemic saw a flourishing of new financial products and the setting up by governments and various agencies of new channel, channels to provide people with necessary information on the support measures available. Moving beyond the pandemic, governors May consider, governments may consider designing or further developing policies and frameworks that encourage the supply and use of a wider range of responsible financial instruments to appropriately meet users' needs. Moreover, it could be useful to take advantage of the momentum to increase financial literacy by directing consumers as well as micro, small, medium enterprise owners towards reliable financial education resources and to encourage them to acquire greater financial knowledge. The second takeaway is that policymakers should strive to make digitalization a springboard for making a leap forward in financial inclusion. This means that we must stay vigilant to ensure fair market practices and embed financial inclusion into our financial innovation approaches and strategies, including when designing financial education interventions and financial information campaigns. The third takeaway is that we need to address the danger of financial exclusion, carefully identifying groups at risk and reinforcing our capacity to understand and assist the most vulnerable, including by means of technology. We are aware that several challenges have to be successfully addressed in order to deliver the ambitious goals of the G20 financial inclusion agenda. I'm sure that this symposium will cast light on a number of them, but other initiatives will need to be carried out to drive the 2020 financial inclusion action plan of the G20 forward. Initiatives involving micro, small and medium-sized enterprises and collecting more granular and gender disaggregated data to inform policy making in the area. Of course, there is much more than just digitalization on the G20 agenda. The pandemic, international coordination and economic policies, enhancing preparedness and the fight against climate change, to mention just a few. I think that important contributions in all these fields have been provided as well. To conclude, let me thank the GPFI co-chairs for putting together such a rich and interesting program. And let me again welcome panelists, presenters, discussants, and all other participants. 
as I am confident that even though we cannot all meet in person in these continually difficult times, the discussions of these two days will be intense and thought-provoking and will deliver new and useful insights. And now, I am... Okay, so I give you the... Okay, go ahead. Thank you very much, thank you. Sorry, sorry about this change. Governor Visco was going to introduce Professor Rajan, uh, who has some problems in connecting, so we will shift uh, the sessions. And hence, I give now the floor to Anna, who will chair uh, the first session of uh, this uh, symposium. Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Magda, and uh, thank you very much uh, again, uh, the Governor Visco, for your uh, introductory remarks. Um, we, uh, we would like to discuss at this first uh, session uh, the impact of COVID pandemic, impact on financial inclusion, financial resilience of uh, people and uh, micro, small and medium business. Of course, already Her Majesty and um, Governor Visco uh, said uh, a lot about this uh, um, difficult time and this um, impact uh, of lives of poor people, underserved people, vulnerable social groups uh, which were hit um, the most by pandemic. Uh, of course, uh, last year when we developed the uh, financial inclusion action plan together with uh, Saudi Arabia presidency, together with uh, Italian presidency and we as co-chairs and the whole GP5, we, uh, uh, we realized that first of all we need to learn the evidence, to learn the data, to understand what's going on, what are the real gaps and what are uh, old vulnerabilities and new vulnerabilities uh, uh, which pandemic uh, express even more. So, of course, we would like to start from um, the findings of the, the key reports in this area uh, and then discuss based on these um, findings already some solutions. Uh, um, therefore, I would like uh, to give the floor to, we have uh, two uh, key speakers in the first part of our session, uh, presenters of uh, our uh, reports, GPFI reports, and uh, first uh, is Leora Klapper uh, from the World Bank. World Bank um, uh, developed one of the key reports, and second is uh, Matthew Gamser and Gada Tema, but I will introduce later again them. But first of all, the floor is to Leora Klapper. Leora, uh, is from Washington, D.C., would, would speak from Washington, D.C., so hope we have good connection with, with her. So, Leora, the floor is yours. This is digital world. You see, we <laughs> rely a yeah, lot. Yeah, she, she was she was already connected. We, maybe we rely a lot on technologies, but uh, yeah, sometimes uh, that's why it's very good to meet in person, right? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but we hope that it will be managed right now. Leora. Yes. Hi. I'm here. Ah, great. Hi. Good morning. We can hear you, we can't see you yet. Okay, here we go. I'm sorry for that delay. Hi. Okay, yes, so let me we, share my we can hear you, we can see you. Please, the floor yeah, is yours. Perfect. Okay, and so give me one second to share my screen. Can you see my screen? Not now, we saw it, but now we, we see only you. Okay, 
rather than yes, it. yes. Now we can we can see it. Okay. If Moving it. If you can make it full screen. Um, it's not. It, it should be full screen. Okay. You see my slides now? Are you good? Okay. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present our paper. Um, and I sincerely wish that I was there with you in person, uh, not only to get around the technological challenges, but also it would be nice. I look forward to catching up with everyone in person. So, to jump right in, um, international agencies report that about a billion people have already received COVID-related wage protection or social protection-related uh, money transfers during COVID. Um, and to practice social distancing, and because of the perception that cash was unsanitary, many of these payments were made electronically, often for the first time. And so take the example I have here of Bangladesh. In March 2020, the government provided a stimulus package of about 600 million US dollars to maintain employment and pay workers' salaries in export oriented sectors, particularly garment manufacturing. And in order to receive the stimulus funds, all garment factories had to digitize their payroll systems and submit mobile money account numbers for their workers. In the first two weeks of April alone, April 2020, an amazing 1.92 million mobile money accounts were opened. And at the peak of the pandemic in July 2020, 87% of wage payments were made digitally. The goal of our report is to document and discuss the, the surge in uh, uh, payments, government payments, wage payments, merchant payments, and more. And the opportunities to expand financial inclusion, especially for vulnerable groups such as women, poor adults, elderly adults, forcibly displaced persons, etc. We also discussed the risks of this rapid digitization, particularly around low levels of financial capability, lagging consumer protection provisions, and higher risks of fraud. Our paper draws on new research, data collection, including 2020 FINDEX data, and case studies. We thank the many countries that provided feedback and suggestions of additional country examples. There's growing awareness that digital government payments facilitate financial inclusion and provision of public services. For governments, digital transfers are cheaper and more efficient as compared to cash. For recipients, digital payments offer greater financial control and leads to a variety of benefits, but their effectiveness is easily undermined by poor product design and implementation. So, for example, research has found that digital government payments have the ability to reduce corruption and administrative costs. For example, governments need to spend lots of money bringing truckloads of paper currency to remote areas. Cash payments also require people to spend time traveling around the country and waiting in line to get their payments at government offices, which was a risky way for COVID to spread during the early days of the pandemic. Digital payments can also improve women's development outcomes by strengthening their control over their money. Um, in particular, there's new research from the World Bank showing that digital payments, especially during COVID, were able to target uh, women and mothers directly, as opposed to in cash. It reduces crime and helps people build savings through default effects. According to a World Bank database that's been tracking government's responses to the pandemic, 71 countries had cash transfer programs in place by April 2020, with 54 of them new initiatives introduced specifically as response to COVID-19. My colleague Ugo Jin Lili and others, they identified at least 58 governments that used digital payments to deliver these payments, often to people that were previously unbanked. The challenge now is how to encourage people to use their accounts for more than just transactional withdrawal purposes. A World Bank uh, CCAF survey asked regulars how they responded to COVID-19. Some of the most common actions taken included uh, increased flexibility in electronic KYC, eKYC, expanded use of digital ID and remote onboarding, increasing transaction limits, and suspending or reducing fees for digital payments. Policies to support economic relief payments, business continuity, and cybersecurity also garnered significant attention. For example, in March 2020, the Central Bank of Jordan amended regulations to enable eKYC to allow forcibly displaced persons to open mobile wallets that could be used to receive government support and remittance payments. Furthermore, fintech's impact on financial inclusion is recognized by 70% of regulators, more than any other objective market development, adoption of digital services, and increasing competition in financial services 
our other leading policy objectives. Concerns with fintech are most notable around issues of risk, consumer protection, financial stability, and market integrity. During COVID, many governments moved to digitizing government payments by, by requiring biometric identification to receive government transfer payments. Country case study we discussed in the paper is the digital COVID-19 relief payments in Colombia, which reached nearly 2.5 million unbanked, including almost a million adults who were previously unbanked. The government was able to deliver aid payments on time and with social distancing and reduce delivery costs. Beneficiaries were able, without leaving their homes, to use these accounts to pay for public services, recharge their cell phones, make transfers to family members, and make purchases in electronic payments. The World Bank survey found that new users had trouble navigating this app, suggesting a need for greater support and attention to product design, and that most recipients completely cashed out their payments. Of course, many families might have needed all the money immediately for food and other urgent family needs. But an ultimate goal should be to help families keep the money electronic and safe with the development, for example, of digital merchant payments. Which leads into new data uh, we discussed in the paper that was collected by uh, the FINDEX questionnaire in 2020 in a, a, um, a uh, shortened uh, module uh, phone survey. Um, it's new data for Eastern Europe and Central Asia and Latin America that show, for example, that more than a third of adults pay in stores using a card or phone in Argentina, Peru, and Mexico, and about half of adults make digital merchant payments in Brazil. Digital merchant payments, however, are relatively uncommon in Bolivia, El Salvador, and Nicaragua. We also, and uh, this will be uh, described in greater detail, both in the paper and forthcoming uh, World Bank policy note, um, a surge in the adoption of digital payments during COVID. For example, over about 15% of all adults in uh, Mexico and some other countries used an in-store merchant payment for the first time during COVID. This again raises tremendous opportunities, you know, how to encourage the stickiness of these payments for people to continue paying electronically even after it's safe to return to cash. We also find inequalities in merchant payments. Men and wealthier adults are more likely to pay in-store using a card or phone. Turkey, men are almost 15 percentage points more likely than women to make a digital merchant payment, which is in line with uh, other inequalities, for example, in account ownership. We discussed a number of financial products introduced during COVID to help people practice social distancing and help sellers stay in business. For example, like here in Washington, many developing countries develop new ways for people to order groceries online. The challenge, however, has always been to encourage people in developing countries to pay online instead of cash on delivery. The Kenyan example on the right is a good example that required payments through the Jumia, Jumia Pay app. This might encourage people to keep the money and wage social support and remittance payments digital, and then make the payments for their groceries directly from their phones. When people have reason to keep their money digital, for example, to pay for groceries and other necessities, they're more likely to do so. And finally, um, the surge in digital payments during the pandemic has created tremendous opportunities. But the short presentation I gave this morning glossed over the real challenges in setting up the supportive regulatory framework, digital infrastructure, financial education, and consumer protections. For example, about half of digital finance users in Kenya and Nigeria reported attempted fraud during the pandemic. Our goal should be to build the financial skills and confidence of the millions of adults around the world who got their first account during COVID so that these adults will use their accounts effectively and safely. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Leora. Thank you for this uh, comprehensive uh, presentation on um, findings from uh, this report. Of course, we all know also that next year we expect uh, the new FINDEX data, so we will have more global data on uh, financial inclusion, and then we can look not only in some cases, some products, but also uh, globally what's uh, uh, the uh, impact of uh, the pandemic, uh, but uh, we have a second, uh, Magda, please, uh, 
uh, informed. So Matthew is ready also. So we have a second speaker from uh, the Washington. Laura, please, uh, you just stay with us. We might have uh, some questions for you after at the end of the session. But now I would like to give the floor to Matthew Gamser uh, from uh, IFC uh, SME Finance Forum. And Matthew will present the um, findings from the second report, uh, which focus more already on impact uh, on uh, small, micro, small and medium enterprises uh, during the COVID pandemic. So thank you very much again, Leora. And uh, Matthew, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anna. Buongiorno, buonasera e buonanotte a todo. Uh, nice to nice to be with everyone. I'm so sorry I'm not there with you in your beautiful city of Rome, enjoying carciofi alla romana and other wonderful things that I can't get here in Washington. But I hope at least you can hear me, and I'm going to uh, share my screen, and then hopefully you will also be able to see my presentation. Anna, please uh, confirm yes, that yes. we're, we're we good. Can, we can okay. <laughs> perfectly hear you and we can see you very well. Thank you. Very, very good. Very good. Well, it's, it's, um, it was very interesting to hear our two opening speeches from uh, Queen Maxima and from Governor Visco. I think they, they echoed many of the key points that uh, you also heard echoed in Leora's presentation. And, and you're going to hear in my presentation, which is focusing on uh, micro, small, and medium enterprises and what we've learned about digitalization and what it's meant during COVID-19 and what it could mean for beyond. Uh, I think the example of Isu Hassan and, uh, and, sh and, um, and Shop Up uh, pretty much summarizes a lot of what the key findings are in the paper we did. Uh, it, it tells you about the challenges that COVID has placed, particularly due to restrictions on movement and restrictions on, on uh, in-person based uh, trade and services. But it also told you a lot about the resiliency about the micro, small and medium enterprise sector and about how, how digital innovation in particular is playing a key role in moving things forward. Um, the report focuses on this area and since tomorrow we're going to spend a lot of time on consumer protection and financial literacy, I'm going to try to focus more on other policy menu lessons that um, even though those are incredibly important, but we're going to spend all of tomorrow on them. So um, I think one of the silver linings of a generally challenging time has been that it has made obvious the need for change and reform in policy. And as a result, we have seen many key reforms that have been of uh, special importance for micro, small, and medium enterprises. I'm not going to go through this whole slide. Uh, please, I encourage you to read the, the whole paper um, where we go through these things in detail and have excellent case study examples. But I want to highlight uh, some of the areas. One is that. Um, Many countries have provided a lot of assistance to the micro, small, and medium enterprise sector, whether they have done it through direct financing, or whether they have done it through indirect measures such as giving these, these uh, enterprises relief on certain obligations or a combination of these. This has been very important, but also as important have been some of these regulatory changes you've heard about, particularly around digital money and in the case of micro small and medium enterprises digital contracting and other business to business arrangements you have seen um, a acceptance of things that there was reluctance to accept before such as uh, adaptation as leora talked about in ekyc and customer onboarding measures uh, digital signatures are now accepted in more and more countries. And more and more regulators have set up uh, innovation centers, sandboxes, they, they, they go, get called by different names so that even further new ideas can be tested. At the same time, we've seen 
potential disparities, potential gaps that could get bigger uh, across countries and across enterprises. And, and in particular, I want to cite that it looks like, as always, uh, women-owned enterprises who have extra barriers on top of those affecting smaller enterprises in general. There seems to be growing evidence that women-owned enterprises have been more profoundly affected by the crisis, and we have to be very, very vigilant about the measures that are taken to make sure that we don't have this be one of the divides that increases. The good news is that there does seem to be, as I learned from Leora, more women ownership of smartphones, and that is really important uh, because feature phones are great, phones are great. Uh, there's been a big gap in women's ownership, and in, in, especially in regions like Africa, but we are seeing this gap closing, and hopefully we can build on that to, to get further. Another um, key issue has been different countries have taken different attitudes towards including non-bank institutions in the work they have done to assist micro, small, and medium enterprises. I would say in general, we are finding that countries that are being broader in opening the government assistance part program participation to more members of the financial sector have seen that broader availability uh, to participate translated into reaching more and more uh, micro, small, and medium enterprises, particularly those that may not have had formal borrowing relationships before or even formal uh, banking or financial relationships. Now, the private sector has shown, as you already heard from Her Majesty Queen Maxima, incredible resiliency and innovative spirit, and we've seen it in many ways. Um, we've seen from the financial sector side, a lot of streamlining and automation of the credit approval process, the customer onboarding process, and the repayment management process. All this continues to make it more and more viable to do smaller and smaller deals with micro, small, and medium enterprises. And that it's that lack of viability with more traditional human-centered uh, manual banking practices that's been one of the core problems, even pre-COVID. As you've heard, we have many digital payment solutions that are now, now available. But even more important, we are seeing, uh, and I'm going to skip to the right side of this slide, we've seen the merger of digital payments with the availability of non-financial, beyond finance, if you want to use a more constructive term, services. So the more micro, small, and medium enterprises are acquiring digital footprints, usually first through payments, the more we are seeing innovations in areas such as uh, e-learning, e-training in basic financial literacy, in customer management, in financial management. Uh, and, and this is, we have always said that this is important, that you cannot just think about financing to solve the inclusion problems of small businesses, but now we are seeing ways to do this beyond finance in even more uh, viable, scalable forms. And e-commerce is also providing, as you've already heard from several speakers, uh, massive new opportunities for the micro and small enterprise sector. So I'm going to skip over the case studies because uh, I'm trying to keep this presentation brief. Perhaps we'll have some time for questions. But we put case studies together in several areas, as you're seeing on this slide. There's a, I encourage you to look at them in the report. There are, um, you know, one of the things the case studies show are the tremendous opportunities, the tremendous potential. Uh, how it's, it's now much easier to get government support to small businesses and even to the smaller and smaller businesses. We see so many examples from our G20 countries where because the government processes themselves have gone digital, whether we look at the PPP program in the United States or other examples, and we've seen the ability to get more and more companies involved We've seen in, in our, our member guarantee agencies in the SME finance forum around the world, we've seen orders of magnitude increases in the guarantees that are being administered for 
small business assistance programs. Now that might contain some risk down the road if there's not very close monitoring of what's going on with small business. We don't want to have that translate into adverse selection and moral hazard. But at least at the moment, it's helped guarantees play an even greater counter-cyclical role than they have in the past. And at the same time, as you have already heard, and the same is true in the MSME case as it is in the case of individuals, new risks have emerged, uh, cybersecurity risks in particular. We've seen an increase in financial fraud and scamming in business-to-business -business dealings, in business-to-bank, in business-to-financial institution dealings. Um, we have seen an increase in the digital financial divide in certain key cases. Um, and in general, unfortunately, groups that have been a part of this divide before now seem to be increasingly uh, divided <laughs> from, from the rest. And one risk I don't think we've, we've talked about is we have seen the emergence of some very large players in certain markets um, who, who not only have large numbers and impressive numbers in giving new access to finance, but they also have large and proprietary access to data. And this is becoming, for a number of policymakers, understandably a concern, and many countries are trying to work through, how do we deal with this? How do we create a better data infrastructure? As Governor Visco had said, we need to continue to improve the financial markets infrastructure. In particular, we need to find ways to make data available uh, and under the control of the owners, the original owners of the data, whether they're the businesses, the customers, um, they, they need to have control over how their data is used. But at the same time, we need to enable pooling of data and anonymization of data so that we can use that greater transactional information to create more um, up-to-date, up-to-the-minute and uh, uh, and. Uh, accurate risk management systems, and we can avoid the potential problems of having a bunch of zombie companies that we continue to finance because we're still backward looking at their data and we're not seeing that the problems of today that, that we really need to recognize. Uh, the, the, we have seen, among other things, think some that something that we've talked about before but we really didn't see so starkly as we do today the limits of conventional credit information and the sort of credit reporting that has gone on in traditional ratings now i say traditional ratings because i'm not accusing the rating agencies of sitting on their hands we are seeing the rating agencies try to innovate as much as everybody else and they are innovating in the same area trying to add new data trying to add real time data especially real-time transactional and uh, commerce patterns data that is a much more accurate and up-to-date indicator of the state of risk in a situation. So Matthew? I will stop there yes. and encourage you all to ask any questions you might have. And, um, and we also just before I go, the Global SME Finance Forum, our annual flagship meeting is the 18th to the 21st of October. I'd just like to remind everyone that you are most welcome there. We are focusing on a topic we're not talking about today, but a lot of people are talking about this year, which is greening uh, finance. But we're going to talk about greening finance at the SME level. So thank you very much. Thank you very Coach much. Here. Thank you very much, Matthew. Thank you for this uh, rich presentation. Uh, I am sure that our participants uh, uh, who are online and who in this audience uh, will have questions to you. So please uh, also stay with us, stay online. Uh, we will uh, have a session of questions answered discussion at the end of this session. But now I would like to give floor back to uh, Governor Biska. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. So it's time now to <clears throat> listen to Rago, Rago Rajan. I hope uh, you are uh, included now so, and, and, and connected. Rago, are you there? I am here. Okay. I have to apologize. So, uh, let, I let was me on UK time rather than continental time. <laughs> let me introduce you then. It is really a pleasure for me to, to introduce you here. We, I had the privilege to work with you uh, when you were uh, 
governor of the bank, Federal Reserve, Fe Fed the Reserve Bank of India, between um, September 2013 and September 2016, we met many times in Basel, and uh, and uh, obviously there were many inspiring exchanges that. Uh, you solicited at the time. At the same time, you also were here in the Bank of Italy in 2013 to deliver our 11th uh, Paolo Baffi lecture. Um, you are now the Catherine Dusak Miller Distinguished Professor, Service Professor of Finance at the Chicago Booth School of Business. And uh, you have also been, as all of us know, Chief Economist of the IMF from 2003 to 2007. Uh, what is um, extremely uh, a pleasure for us is that uh, uh, your research interests uh, really perfectly reflect the agenda that you have today. Uh, you are an expert of the role that finance can play in economic development and inclusion. And uh, have you also, as all of us know and many of us have read, you authored co and co-authored many papers in top journals and book chapters on the subject we are talking today. Uh, and he has been, and you have been awarded several prizes for your work. So there is no further ado. I am very pleased to leave uh, this virtual floor to Professor Rajan. He will deliver a keynote speech on new prospects for financial inclusion in the digital area. So Raghu, I wish to express special thanks to you for being with us today and sharing your thoughts and insights on this uh, crucial issue, uh, one of the most crucial issues that we have been dealing in our presidency this year. Thank you very much, Raghu, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ignacio. Uh, Queen Maxima, Governor Visco, and, uh, and dear friends, um, thank you for inviting me here. And I have to apologize. I was on the wrong time zone, a very old problem for this new digital age and almost, I mean, certainly unforgivable, but I apologize. Um, um, we meet at a time of immense tragedy resulting from the pandemic. We have had so many avoidable deaths, so many examples of government inaction or active misgovernance and so many foregone possibilities for global cooperation. We also, at this time, should not forget how many households have slipped into poverty, how many children are at risk of dropping out as they've been unable to keep up even in this digital age and despite the availability of digital education. And of course, uh, more to the point of this conference, how many SMEs are distressed across the world. Um, we certainly need the old-fashioned remedies such as job creating growth, remedial education, and distress resolution as well as recapitalization for each of these problems. Uh, yet, I think this conference is, is very apt because we shouldn't just see the cup as three quarters empty, it is also a quarter full. Uh, both the private sector and the governments have a accomplished tasks that we would have thought of as impossible at the outset of the uh, pandemic. Uh, one clear example is the discovery of vaccines. Earlier we thought, you know, the minimum time uh, for any vaccine in the past has been four to five years. Uh, it has been done within uh, a year and so many uh, varieties of vaccines as well as their production and distribution has been rolled out in a fantastic example of cooperation between the public sector and the private sector. Of course, there are disparities across the world and we should strive to remedy them, uh, the need for global cooperation, but uh, we should also not diminish the fact of this, uh, of this uh, achievement. Uh, communities also have risen to the challenge and substituted when governments or the private sector were absent, uh, raising the possibility of a new social solidarity uh, if countries can build on it. And I want to talk uh, today about uh, what you've all been already discussing, another possible silver lining, new prospects for digital inclusion, some of it stemming from the needs highlighted by the pandemic. And clearly you've already discussed the uh, need uh, during the pandemic for uh, rapid disbursement of funds digitally. Uh, this was a, a, an important uh, action 
at a time when uh, households and and small firms were hurting. Uh, and uh, it included not just transfers, but also uh, wages and payments within the private sector, as well as the public sector, uh, in a process where leakages were a serious concern. And, and digitization uh, helped, uh, especially when you had targets with clear IDs, with linked accounts, and an effective system of, uh, of knowing whom to send money to and how much. Uh, Many countries brought uh, uh, a whole new set of people into the system, and uh, ideally it came with a lot more data uh, to ensure the suitability of transfers, and where that data didn't exist, some countries have managed uh, to expand uh, their their knowledge about their people and, and how to target them. So the pandemic has clearly created public awareness of the need uh, for financial inclusion, as well as highlighted the tremendous gaps in certain countries, as well as the, the tremendous achievements in others where they have built a digital infrastructure which is capable of reaching uh, many, including the most, uh, uh, the poorest and the most needy. Now, um, you have talked, and I don't want to go over territory that you've already uh, discussed, about many of the aspects of the digital revolution. And clearly the most important is that it reduces transaction and processing costs and allows us to, uh, to analyze enormous amounts of data. Uh, in India, when, when, when I was the governor, one of the biggest concerns was really access to cash. If you had um, a Kashmiri woman, uh, uh, you know, 5,000 feet above the valley floor uh, in her little village and she needed cash, she had to walk down uh, to the valley uh, to reach an ATM uh, if she had a bank account uh, and, and take out the money and walk back up. Uh, uh, that wasn't easy, especially with limited public transport. Uh, today, the uh, availability of digital wallets and the fact that many merchants actually do take uh, digital payments has made life uh, a lot easier. She has to walk down uh, much less frequently uh, to that ATM down in the valley. Uh, that's an example of the greater convenience and access that, uh, that digitization helps ensure. But uh, even in the United States, there are examples why, by which it's the, the access is not just uh, in terms of convenience, which I just talked about, but also greater access to global markets. Uh, it allows many niche businesses today to operate out of remote areas uh, and, and service the world. Uh, one example that I like to talk about is uh, a, a firm which makes uh, um, horse-drawn, high-tech, equipment uh, to do farming services, such as um, high-tech plows, uh, high-tech carriages, and so on. You might ask, who wants horse-drawn equipment today? And it turns out, well, there's an entire community, uh, the Amish, who don't believe in modern uh, machinery and want horse-drawn equipment, but they also want it to be keeping up with the times to embrace latest technology so that it is as efficient as possible while being drawn by a horse. Well, there's a company which makes this, but uh, obviously, uh, like every company, it wants scale economies and it needs a large enough market. It turns out that with the possibilities of the internet, it can access Amish families across the United States and some even in other parts of the world who uh, want to rely on older technology and therefore it has a viable market across the world for this very, very niche business, but uh, it also allows them to create employment opportunities in uh, a part of Ohio which really doesn't have that much in terms of employment. So what you see here are the possibilities of digital technology in, in opening the world uh, to small businesses uh, and, and allowing them to, uh, to function effectively. Uh, obviously you've talked about financial um, um, inclusion of these businesses and so on. That is, a lot of that is made possible by the enormous uh, use of data that we can uh, um, undertake with uh, with digitization. Today, in a number of countries, you have account aggregators uh, who basically try and 
bring together so many uh, facets of data on individuals uh, and allow those individuals to essentially build credit histories even without ever taking credit based, for example, on their, their regular payments of, uh, of, uh, of their bills, of their, um, uh, of their rent, and so on. And of course, for small businesses, they can also, uh, with these uh, uh, new ways of capturing data, uh, make verifiable their sales and cash flow, which allows them the opportunity to, to access credit. So again, uh, one of the uh, advantages of the digital revolution. Let me quickly go through some other advantages which uh, uh, you may already have talked about. Uh, I think one of the problems with financial inclusion in the past was the emphasis on credit as the initial touch point uh, for many people. And, and that I think over time we've learned is uh, probably the wrong touch point because first you want to make sure that people are comfortable uh, with financial management in general, managing their payments, managing their uh, their savings. And, and credit uh, comes later when people have comfort with, uh, with much of this. Obviously, they need credit uh, right up front. But, uh, but you want to make sure they can manage the debt load uh, when they take on credit. And so what I think digitization helps do is sequence better. First, you get people into payments. Uh, then you can open up to more savings. And, and credit comes once they have had some uh, success in building histories there. And I think that sequence, uh, as we move more towards it, of obviously everyone will not be on that sequence, I, I think can make for a more viable financial inclusion. Um, obviously, uh, digitization allows for more competition, not, not necessarily makes it uh, happen, but certainly allows for it. And, and of course, we can have the possibility of cheaper advice and product cost customization uh, with AI, with deep learning, with robo-advising, perhaps we get get to even uh, very poor customers having their hand held as they walk through uh, the financial uh, range of financial possibilities that they have. Um, you know, today we also have uh, a lot more possibilities for contracting without the need for centralized trusted counterparties. Uh, this is the whole uh, uh, area of blockchain cross-border remittances and trade finance therefore are possible without countries trusting each other or having an intermediary in between without banks necessarily trusting each other. And of course, we have smart contracts which allow for payment versus delivery, uh, again, without the need for a centralized counterparty. These, these are very important uh, in a world where, you know, increasingly there are rifts across borders and we may need to find a way to bridge it uh, with the, uh, uh, the the dig digital possibilities we have, and of course, uh, digitization allows for micro payments. Uh, again, making possible, uh, you know, for example, paying for reading an article on the internet uh, makes it possible for a variety of new businesses to start up. Um, now, many of these advantages have downsides, as you know. And uh, you have talked about uh, some of them. Um, unequal access, uh, we've already heard. Uh, um, you know, the elderly, the poor, uh, occasionally women uh, have unequal knowledge about the possibilities of digitization. Uh, and of course, we have unequal equipment or service. Many people don't have smartphones. Many people don't, even in the United States today, have access to broadband. And therefore, they are uh, relegated to a second uh, level of service. Um, many start with unequal data histories. Uh, sometimes uh, it's much easier to build data histories in the formal sector. Uh, and if you start informal, uh, you don't have that, again, unequal access. And, and one of the concerns about uh, uh, digital uh, uh, histories is that you can't be forgotten for some mistake you made, uh, um, for something you posted uh, as a youth, uh, or, or uh, some accident that happened and you couldn't make payments, uh, you're forever remembered and you're remembered across the system. And the worry is that that, uh, in a sense, puts you at risk uh, of being excluded. So unequal access is something we have to think about and how to work with it. Uh, uh, 
we also have uh, excessive access, uh, in particular to criminals. Uh, if you have access, you can be accessed. That is the new mantra. And uh, we have a variety of uh, frauds and scams of the old kind, uh, plus new ones uh, coming up every day. And of course, we have cybercrime. So these are issues that we need to deal with. Uh, we have already heard talk of the dominance of platforms and control over data. Um, who should own data? Well, sometimes it seems like it's most appropriate for the customer to have data. But if a firm has to invest a lot in acquiring and, and, and putting the data into a shape that it can be used, perhaps a firm could also have some uh, elements of ownership but with the permission of the customer, how do we make this possible so that the customer is not captured and there are not huge entry barriers that are built up in this, uh, this business? Um, we have the whole issue of uh, privacy, and privacy becomes extremely important in a world where authoritarian governments are trying to get every piece of data on, on what their uh, what they uh, citizens do and and sometimes this plays in very uh, interesting ways uh, the government acts as if it's protecting uh, the citizen from the private sector and the private sector's excessive use of data uh, without citizen permission and i think that's important but at the same time we need protection from the government also and uh, and how do we make sure that the necessary use of data in, for example, KYC and so on, doesn't become a license to excessive use of data by, by the government. Um, we also have excessive faith in technology. We know algorithms have biases. Uh, we know that, uh, that uh, firms can use uh, behavioral uh, economics uh, to, uh, to essentially make their customers addicted or, or tug uh, or move them towards certain kinds of, of business. We also know that businesses make mistakes. I see the proliferation of buy now, pay later. And I wonder whether in fact these businesses understand what happens to customers in a downturn or are they basing their data largely on good times which we've had in the last, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, Pre, in the pre-pandemic time, and of course, even in in industrial countries during the pandemic, when uh, when incomes have uh, have been maintained. So, do we really know what happens in downturns? Uh, are there behavioral changes in the audience that we are surveying, or are we overly focused on data from good times? And and, and of course, um, one of the problems with uh, uh, with technology unhampered. Uh, by uh, by human uh, sort of input is that sometimes it offers uh, correlated uh, decisions and correlated actions which become a source of risk. Um, another concern is there's very little consumer redress and protection in some of these technologies and we need to think about that. Uh, I, we can talk about the risks associated with uh, stable coins, CBDCs, uh, and uh, with regulation. But let me let me uh, um, sort of uh, focus on uh, uh, you know uh, looking forward. Um, it is clear that technology is both an opportunity and a threat, right? And uh, um, there are so many ways it can be used for the good and um, so many ways that it can rebound on us and uh, financial inclusion through digitization uh, is 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 an area where where both possibilities exist and it's been so with uh, every technology um, we understand that authorities should allow experimentation at a small scale uh, while uh, they try and improve their understanding, and uh, we've heard uh, mention of sandboxes again and again, the idea is really to allow experimentation uh, without sort of uh, inundating the system. But of course, uh, what we have in, in a number of countries now is our technologies we don't fully understand uh, which have acquired a scale which is uh, which is you know hard to imagine uh, without somehow believing that regulators have have let uh, events overwhelm them uh, we have uh, in at this point stable coins of worth hundreds of billions of dollars in in collective and cryptocurrencies worth trillions of dollars 
without uh, you know a good sense of who's regulating them uh, what's going to happen if uh, if values collapse uh, do they in the case of stable coins have enough backing this is certainly something that regulators in the us are starting to talk about but you wonder is it a, isn't it a little late to start talking about it when they're uh, you know uh, with the public to the tunes of uh, hundreds of billions we also need to find a mix of public assets and public intervention that will best align digital finance with public welfare. And this doesn't necessarily mean leave everything to the private sector, nor does it mean occupy the commanding heights with the public sector. It means a very, very careful intervention. For example, uh, in India, uh, we built a commonly owned bridge uh, between uh, various kinds of, uh, of providers of uh, digital um, services. For example, on payments, uh, it is uh, the universal payment interface. And uh, when combined with the broader set of possibilities, uh, we call it the Aadhaar stack, uh, all this designed by Nandan Nilekane, uh, a, a, a founder of Infosys, um, this has worked very well in uh, both providing uh, easy payments uh, without the monopolization that sometimes happens and uh, allowing uh, customers much more control over their data. I'm not saying this is perfect. It has uh, problems which we have to iron out, but the extent of transactions on this is exploding and it serves as a possible model uh, for both developing and developed countries on how to build a public uh, sort of bridge which can uh, make best use of both private incentives uh, and, and private providers as well as reduce the possibility of monopolization while giving customers uh, control over data. Uh, more broadly, uh, we have many issues of antitrust uh, which confront us as we see these giant digital platforms um, with so much control over, over individuals. And uh, we also have the issue of privacy as well as protection from the authorities when the authorities have access to the same kind of data. I think we have to be clever going forward on how we work with all this. Uh, there is the possibility that regulation goes old style, brute force, antitrust, break up the platforms, etc. But that might not be the best for consumer welfare. Instead, we might need finer tools in this modern age, for example, mandated interoperability, uh, uh, clear data sharing via uh, some kind of, uh, of new structures that everybody contributes to. These are things we need to think about. Uh, let me end by saying, uh, again, uh, there's a lot that has gone wrong over the last two years, but there's some things that have gone right. Uh, let us build on that because we need to build for a stronger post-pandemic world. Digitization is certainly uh, a, a process which can lead to much more financial inclusion, uh, fully aware of both the benefits as well as the challenges, I think we can certainly move forward. The reports that are here today, uh, I think, are all playing an important part in moving us in this direction. And I congratulate the authors of these reports, as well as uh, uh, Queen Maxima and Governor Visco for making all this possible. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Professor Ojan. Thank you, Ragu. Thank you for your insights, which I'm sure will be very important also in the discussion that will follow. If I may, I don't want to really go in depth in what you said, except to uh, somehow uh, underline two, two issues that I think are pretty relevant. From all what you said, we, we clearly have the confirmation that uh, financial inclusion is not only an issue for uh, uh, poor countries, uh, less developed economies and so on, uh, and the people and the small firms, micro firms that uh, uh, somehow work over there. But it is something that really very much we face also in uh, advanced and emerging economies, the ones who are uh, really represented in the G20. And uh, it is interesting that uh, this uh, highlights the fact that there are certainly a lot of opportunities 
but the risk of digital divide also, is also within our, our countries and economies. And the second consideration has to do with the fact that uh, the uh, questions that have been raised also by you uh, concern uh, um, issues like data privacy, competition, policy, uh, obviously cyber risk has also been emphasized in the previous presentations, as well as education, regulation, supervision. Now, there is a major need to improve our uh, cooper cooperative efforts. And these cooperative efforts are not only cooperative efforts uh, within, say, what we call the finance track of the G20, that is uh, financial authorities. That's to do with uh, uh, within and across countries uh, uh, trying to put together a really cooperative efforts by various kinds of authorities, those who are concerned with uh, antitrust, as you said, uh, energy protection and uh, cyber risk or the risks really of op operation of all these platforms and at the same time concentration risks uh, that may, may be faced by small firms or medium firms which, which really rely on external providers as well as uh, clearly those who have responsibilities on education and financial education is the one that we are dealing and considering today. So I think uh, your insights are really rich and they really should inform all the work that we, that's going to follow. Thank you very much, Rago. Yes. Uh, thank you very much uh, again also Professor Rajan and thank you very much Governor Visco for participating in uh, our symposium and the opening of it and for the whole support of uh, our financial inclusion agenda during this year and congratulations again with uh, great results of this year. But as you uh, rightly said that uh, there are a lot uh, of room for improvement yet in the world and we all need uh, great uh, interaction national cooperation. So you can rely on us and we will work together in GP5 on these issues. Thank you very much again. And um, uh, we would um, continue our session and um, uh, of course already uh, a lot of insights and strategic not only uh, effects about pandemic but very interesting and uh, uh, important insights uh, how the financial system, financial world will be, can be developed um, after the pandemic. Uh, but now we will go uh, even more deeper in some um, areas in some details so we uh, have panel discussion and for uh, chairing this panel discussion I would like to give floor to Andrea Brandalini from the Bank of Italy. Andrea the floor is yours please uh, introduce uh, participants and chair this session. Many thanks uh, Anna and uh, good day whatever is the time in your own country to everybody. We have just listened to two very insightful reports and a, a, a very interesting talk by Professor uh, Rajan. Uh, I would say that the common theme, of course, of everything that has been said so far is the fact that uh, uh, this discussion may, must be seen uh, against the background of the pandemic of COVID-19. And uh, uh, one thing that is uh, uh, important linked to the pandemic is that uh, uh, there was a, a strong push to digitalization, digitalization of payments. Uh, Raghu Rajan said that it was important to uh, guarantee rapid disbursement to households and firms. The World Bank reports look at the issue from the angle of households and individuals. And uh, in digital payments are uh, often seen as a, a first step towards a more articulated concept of financial, concept of financial inclusion. Uh, so one point that is uh, important in, uh, in that report uh, is that uh, uh, the expansion of supply and demand of digital financial services should go hand in hand with an increased effort by policymakers in building financial capabilities of vulnerable groups and updating financial consumer protection strategies 
to this uh, new financial environment. The SMEFF IFC report took the different angle of uh, uh, looking at uh, how the supply side of digitalization supported micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises in accessing financial services during the pandemic. I said that the pandemic has provided a unique uh, uh, opportunity for uh, fast-tracking uh, this uh, <coughs> digitalization of payments. And the challenge here is again to assist those small firms that still face difficulties in accessing digital financial services by supporting their process and upskilling. So again, there is a close link financial between financial education and financial consumer protection, this time targeted to small businesses or small business owners that is in a way still an unexplored uh, field. And here it is where the work of the GPFI can play a very key role in orienting policy action. So to cut it short, digitalization is a great opportunity for financial inclusion. New providers may enter the market, more people and firms can have access to cheaper financial services. However, as said many, many times in this few, in this couple of hours, as for all great opportunities, there are associated new risks. Uh, the Governor Visco insisted on the cybersecurity side. Uh, Raghu Rajan insisted a lot on the uh, data issues, the knowledge of people that uh, both the government and uh, uh, companies uh, can get from collecting all this data. And there are issues of privacy and, and discrimination. So, but the issue that we are going to talk uh, uh, to deal with in uh, our session is uh, uh, how digital uh, financial services can create new forms of financial exclusion. Now, uh, if we take, as I think we should, a multidimensional view of the human well-being, it is uh, the lesson by people like Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum, uh, Capabilities, uh, the capabilities of function in the society are uh, made of different aspects. And for sure, the digital capability is something that is uh, even more crucial now than it was, for sure, than it was uh, before. But the digi digital capability in itself is itself a multidimensional phenomenon, uh, which has uh, many different facets. Uh, we can uh, discuss uh, the lack of digital literacy that is, uh, or, or the financial skills that are individual or household level feature. But uh, there is also, importantly, the lack uh, of resources, of money to buy a mobile phone or a computer. And there are uh, geographical constraints to the proper digital infrastructure and even ethnical uh, constraints or uh, or other types of constraints. So the digital capability is a multifaceted phenomenon that we must look at from this perspective. So the issue is very complex. The debate, the debate is very rich among scholars, institutions, uh, and authorities. And today we have a chance to go even deeper into this issue by asking uh, their views to four uh, distinguished uh, speakers. We have uh, approximately uh, another uh, 40 minutes uh, before uh, moving to a discussion. So uh, without further ado, I would like to uh, give the floor to the first uh, uh, speaker. Uh, we will have two speakers from academia and two from uh, uh, international organizations. So the first speaker uh, is Professor Thomas Philippon. Thomas is a, a Max Hein Professor of Finance at New York University, Stan School of Business. Well, he was named one of the top 25 economists and uh, among many other prizes. So without uh, uh, spending more time on uh, his uh, career, let me ask uh, uh, Thomas if Thomas is connected. Yes, he seems to be so. Uh, Thomas, you have written specifically on FinTech and financial inclusion but you have also warned against the risk of discrimination. Based on your research, can you tell us what factors can make the digitalization of financial services more inclusive, eventually allowing to reduce inequality among different borrowers? 
And also, should the regulatory and supervisory strategies change, and uh, if so, how to reduce the likelihood of new forms of discrimination and exclusion? Thomas, the floor is yours for approximately eight to nine minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can you confirm that you can see my slides and hear my voice? Okay, good. Thank you very much. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me and, and uh, glad to see the other uh, members of the panel as well. So um, it's very short, so I will just make a, a few points about what we can expect from uh, FinTech. So uh, I got to this topic, I was interested mostly, not very much in FinTech initially, but uh, in uh, the competition and efficiency of the finance industry more generally. Um, and I saw uh, first FinTech maybe 10, 15 years ago as maybe something that would improve competition. Uh, and I think it did, or rather it is doing it. Um, but today, of course, we ask questions about how will FinTech change um, the access, the democratization of uh, financial services. So, um, you know, many other people have written um, and are experts on uh, empirical work. So I, th I thought I, it would be useful to take a more theoretical perspective. What can we expect? And I think that uh, if you take that perspective, uh, I would argue that you can expect FinTech to uh, improve, increase access to asset management services. Uh, broadly speaking, um, with the question mark as to whether it's going to reduce inequality or not, and I'll, I'll be precise about that. Um, if you look at the credit market, um, will fintech reduce discrimination? Probably yes. Uh, eliminated? Probably not. Is uh, is what I think is going to happen. So um, the first thing, just to remind you that uh, if we, if you take a broad measure of the cost of intermediation in the financial industry, you find that roughly um, the spread between you know. Uh, the, the expected return of, on, of savers and the expected cost of borrowers is something like 2% of uh, assets intermediated. And that's been constant for 100 years. Uh, and to me, that was a bit distressing because I was telling me that uh, we should be able to do things cheaper today, but this is not really happening. Well, I think it is happening over the past 10 years, finally. So we see uh, unit cost of intermediation coming down. Um, and that's in part uh, thanks to fintech competing with uh, existing provider and finally providing financial services for cheaper. So uh, that brings me then to the next question. Uh, assuming that it is happening, that the, at least we have more competition, uh, now how will the, the benefits be distributed? So I think that the way to think about asset management is to uh, think about two fixed costs. And uh, I got interested in this because I realized that people were, were very confused, actually, because I, I read many times something about, oh, fintech uh, leverages uh, information technology. Information technology has increasing returns to scale, which is true. Therefore, we should, uh, at least there is the risk of uh, more inequality. And I was like, really? Uh, there is like something missing there. And I think it's because people were just completely confused about two types of fixed costs. So the way to think about it is there is a fixed cost per client which is the cost of establishing a relationship. And the other one is a fixed cost of either entry in the startup model or more like development of a platform or a, an AI uh, provider uh, of services or uh, advice. Um, uh, big fee, let's call it that way. And these are two fixed costs. So both of them do create increasing returns, but it's completely different. The fixed cost per client essentially is the one that creates uh, segregation based on income. It says that small accounts are not profitable and therefore poor people are excluded, okay? The development cost is the cost that the firm is thinking, should I spend billions of dollars developing the uh, AI advisor, um, financial advisor, to replace uh, some of the humans? And, and you know that's a big fixed cost. That's also hugely increasing return to scale. But the thing that's important is if FinTech entry is profitable, then uh, participation will always increase. So what's the intuition? Well, what FinTech does is probably has a big development cost. So in that sense, it does, it does have very strong increasing return to scale. It has a huge fixed cost of developing the platform. But once the platform is implemented, the fixed cost per client is small. And so in any model like that, what happens in equilibrium is the reason the platform, the reason the firm develops the platform is in anticipation of servicing the, the big or medium big accounts. So uh, that's for sure. 
Um, so it's the presence of, of relatively uh, wealthy household that motivates the development of the, of the large uh, efficient platform. But once it's developed, once it's in place, the fact that the cost per client is small means that everybody is going to participate. Okay. And so in other words, like you, you develop a, a super great app on the iPhone because you want the middle class and the upper middle class to, to, to bank with you. Once you have it, the cost to offer the same platform to uh, slightly lower uh, incomes is zero, essentially. And so, in fact, that's that's exactly why uh, fintech is going to democratize access to asset management. It, I think that's what we are seeing uh, in many countries today. So, yes, it is increasing return to scale, but it's very important to distinguish the two types of fixed costs. Um, so, uh, maybe I can skip that. So, it turns out that there is more and more uh, work uh, including actually some by right now, so uh, it's better if I let uh, others talk about it. But I think the data we get is mostly consistent with that, which is that's what fintech does well. Um, there is a fixed cost of investing. Once you do it, you can scale up quickly. The per relationship costs are small, um, and that's how you grow. Um, now, it's less obvious how it's going to work in the credit market, at least ex ante, um, because we have the fundamental you know issue of. Uh, bias in in lending, and uh, it's not necessarily completely obvious whether that fintech is going to improve that or not. But if you look, actually look at the data, you find that fintech use uh, non-traditional data. Uh, they avoid meeting face to face, and typically, uh, it's not that fintech discriminates uh, nothing. So there is some discrimination in fintech algorithm, but it's much less than uh, the discrimination of face to face lenders. And uh, I've seen at least three or four papers in the uh, past months that make that point in various settings in various countries. Um, so I think there, although it's not completely obvious ex ante, and essentially just uh, as a way of framing the issue, uh, the big issue is the distinction between statistical discrimination and, and uh, prejudice. If it's prejudice, fintech is roughly going to get rid of it because that's not profitable. But if it's statistical discrimination, it might actually make things worse because it's going to be smarter than humans at exploiting statistical discrimination. So ex ante, it's not obvious whether that would, on a net net basis, be an improvement or not. It turns out that in the data, prejudice was very strong. Statistical discrimination was uh, strong, but not that strong. And so I think on a net basis, fintech is actually improving also access to credit. Um, now. Uh, one caveat I want to mention here is, um, at least in the simple model I'm using to frame the issue, um, you have people who have access to the good services and people who don't. So when I say that um, fintech improves access, I mean that um, the cutoff for getting access to the good service goes down, so more people have access to it. But of course, there are two ways you can, you can then say the same thing. You can say the middle class now has access to services that used to be only for the very wealthy, so in that sense, inequality between the very wealthy and the middle class goes down. But of course, it also means that the very poor or, or, or the one who lack the education necessary, who are still excluded, then inequality between them and the middle class might increase. So depending on where in the distribution you measure inequality, you might see inequality going up or down. Okay? It's still an improvement, of course, because more people have access to financial services and high quality services. It doesn't mean that inequality between two points of the distribution always goes down. And in particular, there is no guarantee that inequality between the bottom and the middle goes down, just to be clear on that. Um, in terms of the open issues for uh, regarding the last questions, um, well, I mean, that to me, there are two things that are very uh, obvious. The first is, um, you know, we need a, a framework for regulation of algorithms. And um, there's always some things that I think we understand pretty well now, um, which is, um, you know, you want uh, algorithms to be trained directly on outcome variables to the extent you can, because then they will avoid uh, prejudice. Okay, so that's kind of something I think we've learned and we've implemented, uh, because if the algorithm are trained to replicate human choices, then they would, they would incorporate uh, the biases and probably increase them as they make them uh, more, uh, more perfect. So uh, I think that's kind of one example where, um, you know, simple ideas, uh, train the algorithm on outcome variables, not to replicate human choices. I think it's a pretty good starting point, but there is more to do. And the, the big theme here is that ideas about how you regulate algorithms are quite different from ideas about how you regulate uh, human beings. 
Um, and the second uh, big issue in my mind, and, and uh, Raghu alluded to that, is the broad idea of APIs. Like, I think the, at the end of the default lines and the big uh, gaps in enforcement, as well as the barriers to entry, they, they happen uh, at the intersections of different, uh, uh, different players in the system. So it's when you have this interface that you need to be careful both about protection of privacy, uh, data breaches, cyber risk, and of course, uh, competition. So I think it's thinking very carefully about having good APIs so we can have an open banking ecosystem that is safe, but allows entry, and entry requires APIs so that the newcomer can plug in the existing uh, uh, ecosystem and data. I think that's the key. And to me, that's probably the most important regulation uh, going forward. And I think that's eight minutes, so I will leave the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas, for your presentation and for, take, for keeping the time. Let me uh, move uh, uh, quickly, quickly to the next uh, speaker. The next speaker is again from academia. It is she is Professor Rohini Pande. She is uh, the Harry Heinz as the second professor of economics and director of the Economic Growth Center at Yale University. Rohini is co-editor of the American Economic Review Insights. Uh, Roini, you have stressed the importance of strengthen, strengthening financial control of women and its impact on incentives to work, as well as the need of policy actions aimed at empower, empowering the most vulnerable. Given your expertise, what role do you see for digitalization and for digital financial education in particular in empowering people to access uh, to responsible digital financial services? What are the key areas upon which policymakers should focus, focus on to reach the most vulnerable and underserved, more specifically, uh, women? Uh, Roini, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Just to check that you can hear me. Yeah? Great. So let me start by describing a case study. So consider a poor Indian unmarried 19-year-old woman who finished high school in a village and got a job in a garment factory on the outskirts of Delhi in July 2019. She's one of the many young digitally literate Indians who seems to have embarked upon a path of upward economic mobility. She acquires a bank account and a smartphone soon after starting her job. The pandemic then hits and India announces a major lockdown. She first tries to stick it out in Delhi, but she runs out of her meager savings quite soon. So she and her brother are two of the 10 million people who head back to their village. Somewhere along the way, she loses her smartphone. She's luckier than many in that she has access to an employer uh, bank account, but it's not identified as the PNJDY or the government uh, authorized account in which to receive the COVID cash transfers. So India makes great use of its digital back end or its digital financial uh, structure to push out cash transfers aimed at women, but only through these accounts, which she doesn't have access to. So she joins the 176 million other women who are unable to access this cash transfer, even though she's eligible for it. When she reaches her village, she applies for immediate work in the Indian Workfare Program, which guarantees 100 days work for every rural household. She uses her family's household job card, and thanks to the digital back end, you know, wages flow quite fast into that bank account. Train outside the minute. But the problem is that all work under that single family card is attached to a single bank account, which is her father's. Her parents will not give her the money as they don't want her to go back to the city. They think she should get married. So she's unable to access those wages to get money for a bus back. She considers going to the bank outlet and starting a bank account under the PMG device scheme, but is intimidated by the all male staff and the many men milling around. She thinks of approaching the rich landowners to get a bank account, to get a loan. But their incentives are to prevent these links forming between a poor households and the formal sector. It undercuts their ability to extract labor market rents. So once they hear the purpose, they refuse, and they have an easy way of refusing. They can invoke gender norms and say it's time she gets married. Her parents believe that a smartphone will be used by her to talk to boys, and this will reduce her ability to get married. So they refuse to give her a smartphone. 
So now she also joins one of the women in India who contribute to one of the largest gender digital divides in the world, even though India leads the world when it comes to things like number of Facebook accounts. She has no easy way to access the internet, but she could go to an internet cafe. But the internet cafe is full of men watching porn, and it's not very nice to go there. All this means that when her brother re-migrates in July, she doesn't. And three months later, she agrees to get married and now lives in a different village and doesn't work. So I've put together here sort of snippets from different episodes I have seen that I have read about and I have seen in the data. I think there's one version you could have, which is somewhat optimistic to say, well, this woman had started up the economic ladder and maybe if things had been slightly different, it would have ended differently. But in many ways, she was luckier. She knew how to engage with the system to start with. But you can't say that for the many women in India or in South Asia or in many other countries who don't have access to smartphones, who don't have an ability to use this digital system. Raghu talked about the example of a Kashmiri woman who has to go to an ATM less often. But it's very likely that Kashmiri woman actually doesn't have access to a phone at all, or she has to rely on the one that her brother or her husband controls. As India grew in the last two decades and put in place an impressive digital and financial architecture, it's important remembering that India's women fell out of the labor force very fast. India now has some of the lowest female labor force participation rates. In every data set and every survey that I have seen for South Asia, there is one common lesson. Digitalization that proceeds without consideration of how informal and formal institutions and a lack of resources restrict the choices of the poor, restrict the choices of women, are largely going to fail to reach these women. If you're going to use digital financial services to empower these groups, we cannot limit the role of the state to simply setting up the hardware or simply announcing programs that they're going to push transfers out through. The state has to recognize its role in challenging normative constraints and to use its legal and normative powers to reduce the importance of these norms. Equally, we have to realize we cannot rely on the private sector. Toma made the point already that there is a fixed cost to provide the service to any single individual. The average financial service provider is not going to make profits by serving poor populations, especially women. They don't have the incentives to provide the services to an unmarried woman who's going to be a short-term customer until she migrates in marriage, and at best is going to have a patchy income stream. So again, it's going to take subsidies and regulations to address these needs. This is not to detract from the importance of empowering women or the poor more generally, digitally and financially. Rather, my argument is twofold. First, if we don't link these efforts with the recognition of the power structures that limit access of the poor to resources in the first place, we are likely to going to fail. There may be some low hanging fruit that you will get, but you will not hit those who who are essentially being kept out of many institutions because it serves um, a number of people. You know, for instance, in some work I've done, we have seen that digitization has a powerful role in re reducing fund leakages in, um, so in um, transfer schemes. But the benefits of reduced leakage doesn't mean that these programs are expanded. Rather, these are typically used by state and central governments to reduce their fiscal deficits. So you can have digitization, but unless citizens are demanding that the saved resources are pushed back into the security, social security transfer systems, you're not going to see an effect. I think second, and this is particularly important in the case of women, it's going to be very important to ask how digital financial services are going to better link them to labor markets. In pretty much every data set, we also see that women have more agency and more decision-making power if they're able to work for a wage. So put it differently, providing dif digital financial services doesn't guarantee its take up. We have to make the institution accessible and the service is designed for the final use, which is probably in most cases going to be earnings, not account take up. Let me just briefly give one example of how this could be done. So in a field experiment I conducted with a set of co-authors in rural North India, we made a simple tweak to how payments for the federal workfare program that I described in the beginning works. So first we ensured that all women had bank accounts. Then for a subset, we, we put in place direct deposit systems. 
So if you work, you get paid into your own individual bank account, not a family bank account. And then third, for a subset, we train them on how to use digital accounts. What we found was that within a year, there was increases in women's work, and this was not just those who were already working, but among those who had never worked before. And they were working not just under the workfare program, but also in the private sector. The second thing we saw that three years later, there had started to be a change in norms. Women uh, more strongly believed that they should work, and the husbands believed less that they would be uh, they would face social sanctions if they didn't, if they were not the bread, sole breadwinner for the family. So you can see change, but it was a case of trying to track it through to the final outcome. So I've talked here largely about women, but let me conclude with two points about how I, what I think we should be thinking about if you're thinking about digital financial services for women. First, any institution that seeks to empower the poor must engage with the past structures that limit them to start with. Thoma discussed this with reference to prejudice and statistical discrimination. I think economists are just beginning to recognize the fact that we also need to be thinking about systemic discrimination. We also need to recognize that what looks like prejudice is a cover very often for being able to access labor market rents. By saying that I don't want uh, women or I don't want lower castes or I don't want African American individuals to enter some system, I'm managing to uh, keep some labor market rents for myself. If the, if the powerful who come across as prejudiced or who come across as um, having some access to uh, labor market rents are actually also gatekeepers, then competition is not going to be enough. Uh, systemic discrimination will continue. And I think in a system like digital financial services, where a significant fixed cost to be borne, you're going to continue to have these gatekeepers. Second, I think it's important that we don't stop at thinking of financial digital services as an end in itself. We don't stop by asking about our cash transfers being done by mobile phones as an end in itself. Um, I've seen this firsthand in the case of India's COVID transfers is there's a huge gap between the amount that was being pushed out and the amount that was actually being received by those who were officially meant to be eligible for it. And finally, I would say the labor market is central here. Um, we, can, we, can talk, we cannot talk about cash transfers as an end itself if you really want to empower individuals. We're going to ask how they're going to be able to use that or the financial services to um, access labor markets. So let me just stop there. Thank you very much. Many thanks, uh, uh, Roini. Now uh, I give the floor to Dr. Jean Pez. Jean is the Global Director for Finance, Competitiveness and Innovation at the World Bank, where he leads uh, uh, the bank's work to promote the development of sound, stable, sustainable and inclusive financial systems. Jean, capitalizing on your extensive work at the World Bank, uh, what role do you see for digital financial services in creating opportunities, especially for women? How could digitalization bolster their financial inclusion and prevent that uh, algorithms turn into discrimination tools? Do you see any case for broadening the data used to alternative uh, sources? Uh, Jean, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear me well? Yes. yes? Okay. Thank you very much, and thanks a lot for the invitation to the uh, symposium. I wish I'd been able to join you. Your room in, the, in Rome is much better than mine in, in Washington. Uh, so let me start by sharing a, a few critical data points uh, to help us better appreciate the risk of exclusion that women face in particular. And then I will focus on one particular challenge, challenge that in our view needs more attention in the dialogue on financial inclusion, which is a weak financial consumer protection which might lead to greater exclusion for women. And I will also touch on one important issue, which is the challenges faced by women-owned SMEs. So, I mean, uh, to restate the obvious, and all of you know that financial access is the first step to economic mobility, and yet in 2017, we still have 1.7 billion adults worldwide, and the majority of, one, of them women, who did not have access to finance, even though two-thirds own mobile phones. And despite progress, women still have less financial access than men. They were disproportionately affected by COVID-19 pandemic, 
which compounded effect for those who are already living in poverty. And as mentioned by several speakers, some of this gap is driven by dividing the use of mobile phone and internet caused by unequal access to infrastructure and technology. I mean, if you look at the numbers from the latest GSMA data, it tells us that women are 7% less likely than men to own a mobile phone and 15% less likely to use the internet on their mobile phone. And obviously uh, improving that is key to accessing digital financial services. So we must address this disparity to ensure that innovation in fintech and digital finance can close the financial inclusion gap. Research from Kenya showed that mobile money was instrumental in increasing account ownership among, among women and increasing household savings. In Zambia, a World Bank um, a government payment digitization project for women and propelled the use of other financial savings products. No need to emphasize that fintech has been a game changer during the pandemic, allowing countries worldwide to rapidly digitize payment. This solution address concerns that apply especially to women, such as convenience, personal security, and confidentiality. So while technology can help bridge the divide, it must be carefully managed to avoid risks that can disadvantage women and the poor. And in particular, this risk may be exacerbated by the lack of appropriate financial consumer protection. Financial consumer risks from digital finance are not new or unique to digital finance, but they may be amplified by technology. For instance, vulnerable groups may find it easier to get new financial products that they are unprepared to use. This could expose them to more fraud and suitable products and transparent fees and discrimination. New risks can be the result of new actors, business models and product features. Just one example, pre-pandemic, Kenya showed breakneck growth in mobile lenders, accompanied, accompanied by worrying levels of default and delinquency. Anecdotal report also indicated aggressive sales and debt collection practices, as well as rising level of debt stress. In some cases, high interest rate and fees have resulted in APR above 400%. The, the pandemic is also highlighting our risk to vulnerable cons consumers can grow in times of crisis. There are reports of more scams, frauds, credit risks such as non-performing loans and exploitation. And although financial consumer protection is a growing priority for policymakers, the pandemic and rise of fintech demonstrate that it must also be an imperative for systemic stability. The global financial crisis of 2008 and other national ones provided our lessons on the importance of financial consumer protection for the financial health of individual consumers and the stability of the world financial system. Now, access to digital uh, channels can lead women and other groups with low digital literacy and financial capability to sign up for financial products that are not right for their needs. Products may lack transparencies in fees and other terms and conditions. And the existing gender gap in digital literacy and skills makes women particularly vulnerable. Any money product, for instance, may have unclear fee and charges, and consumers can sign up for more expensive product than they realize, causing debt stress and eroding consumer trust. So in a nutshell, the rapid expansion of digital government payment during the COVID pandemic have exposed more people to this risk. Cash transfers, remittances, and other forms of income support are being made available through digital payment accounts such as e-money. Consumer may feel that they have no choice but to accept the product, even if it's not the best for their needs. In addition, digital finance could drive over indebtedness. One recent industry analysis project that global financial lending will rise from an estimated 400 billion in 2020 to 3.1 trillion by 2027. In some markets, this trend appears to be well underway. In 2018, 21% of mobile phone owners in Tanzania had taken a digital loan, and 35% in Kenya. Yet these products can be expensive or unsuitable for women. Financial services providers may also exploit behavioral biases to encourage customers to take on more debt than they need. In Georgia, the proliferation of predatory lending, online lending platform resulted in growth of household debt. And by the way, uh, Leora is leading uh, the forthcoming World Development Report that will be issued early 2022 that will look at firm and household debt in the context of a resident recovery. And it notes that very few countries in the world have a functioning personal insolvency framework that would allow an over indebted customer to have a fresh start. So forward looking, uh, women need financial literacy training. 
according to the S&P Global Literacy Survey, financial literacy five percentage point lower among women at 30 percent compared to men, 35 percent. And women have weaker financial skills than their male counterpart, according to some studies. Therefore, tailored financial capability program could help address this risk. And that's why our financial education intervention focuses on gender. Financial consumer protection is another key area of focus. The bank has supported countries like Egypt, Pakistan, Cote d'Ivoire, and Zambia to strengthen financial con uh, consumer protection frameworks. Countries can build on this technical assistance through development policy lending operation or other forms of support. For instance, after receiving targeted technical assistance, Indonesia incorporated financial consumer protection as a priority towards improving financial sector efficiency in a recent lending operation. But the threat of financial exclusion does not only affect individuals, it also affects women-owned businesses. The AFC estimates that 70% of women-owned SMEs in the formal sector in developing countries are underserved by financial institutions. FinTech and alternative data may offer a creative solution to the lack of credit information and an availability of traditional collateral for loans that cause this gap. And, and several of my colleagues on the panel have already mentioned that. Now, on the other hand, we have examples of how we can use uh, new tools to uh, tackle this debate. And one important example we have is the Women Entrepreneurship Development Program in Ethiopia. This pilot, this project piloted psychometric loan screening to improve credit decision. After a series of psychometric tests were conducted on borrower to assess their ability and willingness to repay a loan, we see that women were assigned credit score based on their response. And this program worked with Ethiopia's largest microfinance institute to provide loan to over 2,000 women entrepreneurs. The use of alternative data and artificial intelligence must be done responsibly and fairly, and, and to mention the risk and the, the opportunities there. We have seen evidence that underlying data can be biased through algorithm decision making and cause biased credit decision and pricing. Our message there is that a deliberate gender focused approach to data can address exclusion risk. Undertaking diagnostic study and collecting sex disaggregated data can improve what financial institutions know about their women client and manage their risk. And we need stronger consumer self-guard to also mitigate algorithmic uh, bias risk. Now, to conclude, uh, emerging technologies generate opportunities and challenges, and the bank remains committed to expanding financial inclusion for women. We're increasing the collection of sex disaggregated data and supporting national commitment to closing the financial inclusion gender gap. We're also working on digital financial services in 50 countries both through lending and advisory on the full range of digital finance activities from digital ID to payment banking regulation to digitizing government payment. A strong financial consumer framework is critical to the development of appropriate tailored digital financial services that serve women and women-led SMEs. And as GPFI members and implementing partner working together, we should strive to build proportionate risk-based consumer safeguards to ensure expanded access to digital financial services as a way to contribute to wider welfare gains and shared prosperity. Thank you very much, Andrea, and back to you. Thank you, Jean. And now I'm delighted to give the floor to Ratna Sahai. Ratna is Senior Advisor on Gender in the Office of the Managing Director of the IMF. And uh, she's, <coughs> she was, uh, uh, until last April, a Deputy Director in the Monetary and Capital Markets uh, Department. Ratna, in the past several years, uh, you led the IMF work on financial inclusion, including the digi digitalization. Uh, could you elaborate on whether and how digital finance is helping foster inclusion and growth in emerging and developing countries? What trends are you observing based on the indexes that your team has produced in digital function, on digital function inclusion? With further digitalization, do you see risks of financial exclusion going forward for specific groups? Uh, eight minutes, please, because we are uh, running short of time. Uh, Rat Ratna. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Uh, so good afternoon to Her Majesty Queen Maxima and to Governor Visco. Uh, very good day to all participants. And thank you, Mangda and Andrea, for inviting me to this panel. I'm delighted to participate on behalf of the IMF. Indeed, 
Financial inclusion is an important area that I've worked on quite extensively. Uh, and motivated by the right rapid adoption of technology in the financial sector, we recently shifted focus to digital financial inclusion. In a paper we published last year, we combined our imp empirical study with interviews of more than 70 stakeholders globally. Uh, as part of this study, we developed an index, as you rightly mentioned, on digital financial inclusion, which used the IMF's financial access survey and the World Bank's index. Uh, so before I vote on our findings, I, I just want to mention uh, to, to our colleagues that uh, we have made huge strides now in collecting the relevant data, the financial access survey. It's a unique source of annual supply side data on access to and use of basic financial services, covering about 189 jurisdictions uh, with 17 members. So over time, we have expanded the coverage to include digital services and gender disaggregated data. I want to especially thank Queen Maxima for pushing the agenda with country authorities on collecting data, without which any serious analysis is not possible on financial inclusion and especially on gender disaggregated data. So let me highlight three main findings from my research. First, countries in Africa and Asia are the clear leaders in digital financial inclusion. This is not surprising considering the significant role played by M-Pesa in Africa or Alipay and WeChat Pay in China. That said, almost all the countries saw a rise in digital financial services in recent years. In some countries, interestingly, digital financial services has been the main driver of financial inclusion. And we, of course, expect this trend to accelerate, and it has accelerated during the pandemic. So this is all good news. Second, another enc encouraging finding, uh, and uh, Tomas mentioned this, is that digital financial services uh, is really helping increase financial inclusion. And this is associated with higher uh, GDP growth. So this is consistent with our findings in earlier papers that greater financial inclusion goes hand in hand with favorable macroeconomic outcome, what we really care about at the IMF, uh, higher growth, lower inequality, and higher financial stability. So clearly lower cost of digital services, faster speed of transaction, convenience to save is improving all our lives. In times like this, it is also enabling us to cope with the shocks. Third, we also explored the question of whether whether digital financial inclusion helps narrow gender gaps. We found that uh, gender gaps are generally narrower in digital financial inclusion compared to the traditional uh, uh, financial services. But there was significant variation across regions as well as within. And interestingly, not surprisingly, we found, for example, South Asia, the, in, the gender gap has actually widened. Why? I will not go into it because Rohini very vividly described to us how cultural and social factors are really important. Uh, a forthcoming paper that I'm co-authoring on women leaders in fintech finds a very strong association between women leaders in fintech and usage of digital services by women. This is a global study. So to me, this bound points to some cultural factors, but also the presence of women in senior positions, which could be inspiring more women to access digital services. So what are the risks and challenges? There are a number of them, as well as new potential sources of financial inclusion. Uh, some of it, I will repeat what previous speakers have said, because they are important. So first and foremost, there's a distant risk of a digital divide that leads to greater financial exclusion of low-income households, SMEs, and women. So access to digital infrastructure such as mobile phones, internet, electricity is essential. According to Global Mobile Industry Association, for example, uh, women are 8% less likely to own mobile phones than men globally and 20% less likely to use the internet on, on mobile phones than men. These gaps are larger in the developing world. 
this digital divide is not limited to women. It also risks excluding the old, the poor, those in the rural areas where mobile phone networks do not reach, inter internet connections are sparser, or electricity is less reliable. The second point I'd like to raise is the importance of literacy, both digital and financial. While digitalization is making access to financial services easier, faster, more convenient, it's simply not going to be possible for the wider population to benefit unless it is accompanied by an acceleration of digital and financial literacy. Following up from what Governor Visco had said earlier about advanced economies, during our interviews with stakeholders across the world, I was, to be honest, really surprised to learn that few countries have rigorous and mandatory courses in financial literacy in middle or high schools. This was true also in the advanced economies. But beyond literacy, there's also a need to invest more broadly in human capital, especially in the STEM fields, for a wider section of the population to benefit. Third, what are the potential risks to financial inclusion? The use of big data analytics enables the assessment of creditworthiness and access to credit, which was previously not possible, as Thomas mentioned. This is, of course, good news. But during our interviews with fintech companies, they acknowledged the real possibility of biases in data or algorithms as a source of financial exclusion. These biases particularly impact minorities, women, low-income households. So it's an open question, you know, what is the net uh, gain? Concerns on data privacy and cybersecurity, of course, could erode trust, undermine advances. Uh, and uh, uh, many of you have mentioned that, including Raghu. And regulation and supervision really needs to keep pace. This is something we heard from everybody, almost all the st stakeholders. And this is especially to ensure financial stability and integrity. Fourth, ensuring competition in Digital financial services is also important, and, and, and Tomas talked about this. So COVID-19 is likely to be the first significant shock to many fintech firms that uh, tend to be relatively young, and it is the first step of their resilience. Should they scale back their services or the sector becomes more concentrated, with already a very large presence of big techs, it may affect the more vulner vulnerable disproportionately. Similarly, there's a risk that microfinance institutions and smaller banks that cater more to these segments cannot adopt to digitalization and they may retrench their services too fast. We are really concerned about that. So let me conclude by talking briefly about the policy implications. It is clear that digital financial inclusion has, in, has, has been benefiting uh, uh, the wider population and it continues to have enormous promise to improve macro economic outcomes and welfare, and also make the recovery from the pandemic more inclusive. But in addressing these, the challenges and the risk, there are complementary roles for both the public and private sectors. And finally, I'm beginning to get convinced that the effectiveness of policies uh, that IFIs measure or national authorities measure it should not just be in terms of the outcomes, but also how these policies affect cultural and social norms, which affect the minorities and women adversely. And I would like to encourage more, more work in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Ratna. So, as Ratna has just said, uh, uh, women leaders are better than men leaders, and I've been a very bad uh, chair. So, I, leave, I give immediately the floor back to Anna and Magda for the rest of the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrea. Thank you very much, all uh, speakers who participated, experts who participated in this panel discussion. We are a little bit running out of time, but we still have uh, some uh, short time for questions and answers. And first of all, I would like to uh, invite uh, those uh, GPFI uh, delegates, GPFI participants who are online. I, uh, unfortunately, I can't see you all, but I hope that you can see us. But 
that you would not feel excluded. You have uh, um, the right, the privilege to ask questions first. So if you have questions, please uh, let us know. Uh, Magda, how technically do we, uh, can we give the floor to ask questions? Okay, uh, if um, we have questions, please uh, um, take the floor and ask. Uh, Colleagues, if you can help us, who do, whom we can, yeah, thank you. And uh, just to remind that questions uh, can uh, be to all uh, panelists, uh, and also I hope uh, Matthew and uh, uh, Laura are still with us, so if that's the case, to ask them. But please be very, very brief, uh, I think. We see that there are some questions written, but uh, we can't read them. Uh, so, uh, please, um, Italian colleagues, uh, help us with that also. No questions. Oh, okay, so if there is no questions online, uh, is, um, are there any questions here in the room or comments? Yes, please, there is a question. Just in front of you, you can press just in front of you. Thank you, Madam Chair, thank you, Madam Co-Chair, and uh, thank you for organizing this really lovely event. It's very much appreciated. I have a quick question to Ms. Ratna Sahai um, at the IMF. Um, she shared with us her surprise about a lack maybe of education in secondary uh, schools about financial and digital literacy. Um, I, my own experience in school is that we never had any <laughs> schooling around this. Um, I also see a lot of discussion in country about what should be in the school curriculum. Um, as a country, we support it in some developing countries, uh, a curriculum on financial literacy. Um, but I think if I look only at my own country, I think it will be complicated to find uh, people who can teach us in secondary schools and help the teachers teach the digital and financial literacy. So um, is it possible for IMF to give us a short advice how we should take this up both in advanced countries and, and for developing countries? If there is a short answer, it would be really appreciated. Thank you, Madam Chair and Madam Co-Chair. Thank you very much uh, for that question. Uh, you know, uh, what you said is absolutely correct because uh, one of the governors in, in, in Asia uh, mentioned to me that uh, in central bank governors that they were very aware of this problem so they were very quickly uh, speeded up uh, introducing a curriculum and very quickly as you rightly said they couldn't find teachers so we have to train not just the young but also the teachers on your question how to do it, I really have to ask my World Bank colleagues. They are much more of an expert in this area than the IMF is. So let me uh, hand it over to them on how to increase uh, financial and uh, digital literacy in schools. Thank you. Thank you very much for question. And for answer, I just want to promote that tomorrow we will have special dedicated session on digital financial literacy and uh, we will discuss uh, these uh, issues more in depth. I, I am just also glad to say that uh, uh, Russia uh, this year just adopted new school uh, standards. So we will have uh, financial literacy elements mandatory from the next year. So I can give uh, more examples a little bit tomorrow and then if you're interested but of course uh, it's um, uh, it takes time and uh, a lot of uh, coordinated efforts uh, are there any other questions to our speakers uh, Magda 
I think we have a question uh, from Paul Nelson from USAID. You can talk, I think, uh, yourself. Paul, we cannot hear you. Otherwise, we can go to the se second question, I think, in the chat from Jan Frost for Ratna. You mentioned that the gender gap is generally smaller for digital financial services than for traditional services, but that this varies across countries. Have specific policies been associated with lower gender gaps uh, in digital financial services? Ratna, again, the floor is yours. Uh, Thank, thank you very much. I mean, of course, there are many factors and the, the drivers uh, uh, do matter. Uh, so, uh, so two things uh, that we have found, but I, I will confess we have to do more, more work. One is the, uh, the social uh, and cultural norms play a huge big role. And, and, and Rohini really illustrated very well how they play a big role in this uh, digital divide. Uh, a second issue is really about access, access to, to the hardware, uh, uh, both the digital as well as the, you know, the physical, the, the electricity. Uh, so uh, people in uh, uh, remote areas um, get affected, both men and women. Uh, and then if you add the social norms, then you see women getting uh, a lot affected. Uh, uh, but I also want to say that I know it takes years for cultural norms to change, but if you have fantastic leaders, political, economic, social, these things can change very fast. So I'm very optimistic as long as we can have policies going in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ratna. So do, do we have uh, questions yet online? I think we have one for Thomas Filippon. Uh, could you speak to any views you have on consolidation within the financial sector affected by fintech? Thank you. Oh, yeah, so that's complicated actually. It depends a lot on how the, the big players in the fintech are, are going to interact and it depends a lot on what the big tech firms, we, we haven't really discussed a lot the role of Google and, and these guys so far. So. Um, I think there are, so there are a couple of scenarios you could imagine. So right now what's going on is that the, the big tech firms are looking at finance but not really getting into it because they realize it's too complicated or it's too, too regulated. And the fintech firms and the, the banks and asset managers are both competing and working together. So it's a mixture of uh, competition in some cases and symbiotic relationship in the other. So in that world, um, I think that we might see some consolidation, but I don't think there's anything too uh, extreme that would happen. If uh, things change in the sense that if the big tech companies decide to really get into finance, then there's no question that would lead to big changes, including consolidation. So that's the big unknown as of now. Um, also, everything I say has a very Western tint, of course. I mean, in China, things are different. They are not moving in the same direction necessarily. So uh, I was speaking more about what's going on in the US. Um, so my sense is that the big uh, tech firms today are busy with their own antitrust issues. So I'm not sure they are very eager to jump fully to finance. So my expectation is I don't think we're going to see they say a lot. Um, and then we're just going to have the consequences of returns to scale. So robo advising is expensive. So we're going to have we don't we are not going to have 40 companies investing a lot in robo advising. Maybe we'll have five or ten. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, please, uh, ask, you can ask the question. Um, I wanted to respond to that question. Is it possible to do that first? Oh, okay, okay, let let Ed, sorry. Uh, I, 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 I want to slightly, I mean, Thomas did open the door because he was saying that if we look beyond the Western countries, uh, uh, you know, the picture may be a bit different. I think if we back up, we have seen a tremendous consolidation of the financial sector pre-COVID. Um, and, and even since the global financial crisis, we emerged 
with the larger financial institutions, larger than ever, and with a more dominant market share. We might be seeing some changes now, uh, and COVID may be accelerating that with, with two respects. One is, of course, in emerging markets, as Thomas said, where we have never had very good coverage at the base of the pyramid. In many countries, we are seeing a substantial share of new coverage coming from non-traditional players. But even in advanced countries, we are seeing in certain segments, I would argue that in the SME segment, we are seeing a substantial uh, inroads being made into this market from non-traditional players, despite the increasing, the continuing consolidation of the sector. You need only look at something like the PPP program in the US and who were the largest players in that when the government finally figured out how to really get the uh, quickly the resources to the small business. Same is true of C-bills and, and the other programs in the UK. Once, you, once the FSA opened up and really started letting uh, alternative institutions play in that space. And, that, and this accelerated a trend we had started to see before COVID that while they still represented a, a relatively small share of the market in areas like small business where they were never very well served by traditional practices, we have seen a, a, a broadening of access, a, 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 a deconcentration, if you will, so in certain segments, we do see movement away from what had been a general consolidation. Thank you, Mathieu. Uh, Iswari, the, your question. Thank you, co-chairs. My question is also for Thomas. Um, I thought your analysis on fixed costs uh, for fintech vis-a-vis -vis the traditional players was quite interesting. And I wonder if your study also included um, or looked at you know, other factors such as uh, the source of funding, particularly in a fintech's ability to scale to serve low-income customers. Because we, as, as, as we know, many of the fintechs are funded um, you know, or financed by VCs and there are very high expectations on return on investment. Um, and as Rohini said earlier, this um, low-income segments are not the most obvious um, profitable segment to serve. Uh, and so my question is really, are there other factors in a fintech's business model beyond fix, uh, the, the cost um, that, that also imp impacts their ability to be inclusive? Thank you. Thank you very much, but please uh, try to answer shortly. We have a few more questions, but we would like to be quite brief. Yes, so, so I think that uh, the, the next big factor will definitely be access to uh, deposit funding, because that still remains by far the cheapest source of funding. So the solutions there are typically fintech are going to team up with banks if they need to scale up, because the banks still have access to deposit funding, which is much cheaper. So if, in fact, going back to a little bit of what Matthew was saying earlier, if you, if you want to uh, think about competition being uh, one of the uh, source of uh, inclusion, so um, to, to foster competitions, I think that um, one issue is going to be if banks, traditional banks, keep their monopoly uh, on access to deposits, then fintech is going to have a hard time scaling up. Um, and uh, so there are many ways you can think about it, but uh, I think that the way the system is set up now, the banks still have a structural funding advantage. And so that's going to be an impediment for, for fintech growth and therefore for, for inclusion. Thank you very much. We also got a comment from Jen Pesme. Uh, uh, to add to Ratna, we also see that the following factors help uh, gender gap make uh, to decrease gender gap, make it explicit objective and measure like gender disaggregated data, focus on digital and facilitate account opening for women. And we will discuss um, more the plenary session, this um, gender disaggregated data, but uh, I think this uh, uh, also very good suggestions. Uh, and uh, US, USAID, uh, Paul Nelson um, also 
commenting, I think. Uh, in FinTech, I am thinking of countries like Kenya, host to a dominant player, um, PESA in payments, and as Matt comments, the impact of COVID-19 can include weaker smaller FCPs being unable to maintain their footing. I don't know if uh, Matt also wants to comment uh, that, or, uh, uh, and probably uh, just also very um, brief um, question to uh, Matt uh, about women as um, uh, Matt said that women owned enterprises have more barriers. Uh, do we have understanding if it's uh, uh, quite similar barriers in different countries or they are really different and uh, how much uh, uh, it internal barriers, let's say, like a low, low level of financial and digital literacy already discussed a little bit, if you can just say a few words, but of course we will continue tomorrow uh, presenting OECD data and discussing these issues. Um, let me just speak. I, I, I answered in the, the chat, which maybe can be shared later on, on Paul's question. I hope Paul can read that. Just on the matter of women, um, look, at the end of the day, uh, lower financial literacy is, is often a product of lower access to education in general, which, which was a problem before COVID. Um, and, and so there are gen generic problems that face women's access to digital financial inclusion, whether as individuals or as, as entrepreneurs that, that go from country to country. There are in individual countries, some specific problems that generally relate to uh, laws about control of assets, uh, abilities to sign contracts, things that, that can vary from country to country. But again, in, in general, they they fall into areas where women are not afforded equal access to economic opportunities and for people that want to look into that in more detail the world bank's women business and the law program maintains an annual database on this situation and we also uh, make that database available through the sme finance forum website it's really a very useful resource to see um, which, which problems arise in which places and how relatively uh, few or more barriers women seeking economic opportunities encounter in different countries. COVID um, has, has really, uh, it's certainly not made things better. And the data that we're getting from World Bank surveys and, and other surveys like Facebook uh, data surveys that the World Bank is helping process are showing us that they may be making things worse and exactly why is something we need to delve into. Thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, one more question uh, from Edgar Cortez, Bank of Mexico, uh, for Professor Pande. What is your perspective on how to foster better financial product design for women, taking into account the different attachment to the labor force and discrimination of them? Uh, would, uh, what should be the role of, for public authorities? If you can also briefly elaborate. I'll try to be short, and I'll just, I think, repeat one thing I was trying to say is that it's important to almost not create this sort of special category of women, but rather in some ways to see them as a group that has weak attachment to the labor market, both because um, of constraints they face in public, in the public sphere. So as Matthew said, the World Bank, um, the law database shows many ways that happens, but also because of what happens in the household. And so if you want to act, you need to act on both fronts together. I think very often what happens is we don't touch the household and we say we are going to actually just, you know, try to provide equal access to girls um, for education or we're going to provide scholarships. But if these scholarships, for instance, are going through the household and going to a parent's account and the parent doesn't particularly want their daughter in school, that's not going to work very well. So it could well be that in some cases, what you need to do is actually empower girls more than you're empowering boys. So you may give boys scholarships to the parents' accounts, but open accounts directly for young girls and educate them because the household is not necessarily a place that's free for discrimination from them in many cases. So mostly I think what we need to do is we need to recognize that labor market discrimination certainly operates through discrimination in the public sphere but it's also very linked to what's happening in the private sphere. And so we need to actually address both of them together. So let me stop there. 
Okay, thank you very much. And uh, yes, and we have also comment. Uh, no, I, I think we already, yeah, we already, <laughs> uh, I read already this comment from Jen Pesme. Yeah, if you want, ah, so sorry, yeah, of course, uh, I just uh, uh, read this comment question. I will remind and maybe, uh, uh, maybe you can also reply. So the question to add to Ratna, we also see that the following factors help gender gap, make it explicit objective and measure gender disaggregated data, focus on digital and facilitate account opening for women. So uh, just a question if Ratna, you would like to comment on this. Uh, no, I, I don't think I, uh, uh, I have anything additional to say than, than what I had said. I mean, I just want to emphasize uh, the point that, uh, you know, what is special about uh, inequities uh, on the gender side is, is um, that it is really important to have uh, role models, to have uh, women in leadership positions, whether it's in the private sector or in the public sector, to make changes on all possible aspects. Uh, and I think Rohini herself has done some really good work on, on, on the political side, uh, uh, which shows how uh, when women enter politics, uh, it really inspires uh, girls uh, uh, to, to, uh, to even educate themselves and, and, and be better. So um, I just want to emphasize this point that policies should also be uh, targeted at uh, not just equalizing access to financial services, but also equalizing uh, access and opportunities for women to lead in these areas, both traditional financial inclusion as well as digital. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ratna. Actually, totally agree with you on women leadership role. So we uh, we just started today discussion. Tomorrow we will go also even more deeply in some aspects of financial literacy and financial consumer protection. So uh, first of all, I would like to uh, to thank uh, all uh, speakers and experts who participated today uh, in virtually or uh, here in presence. Uh, thank you very much for your input, your valuable presentations. Uh, again, tomorrow we will continue that. So please uh, also all uh, participants, uh, GP5 members, uh, stay tomorrow online. We uh, look forward to uh, continue on discussion on financial literacy, digital financial literacy, financial consumer protection. Of course, we see that today many questions on gender, on women empowerment, many questions on fintech. We will continue, of course, discussing discussion tomorrow. Uh, I would like to give uh, floor to Magda, just probably also for a few closing uh, remarks on today. Well, I don't have too much to add uh, because the discussion was very lively. There were a lot of questions, uh, so, um, but also some answers. We will keep on giving answers, I hope, uh, tomorrow, more uh, in terms of policy uh, responses, specifically in the area, as Anna was saying, of um, financial consumer and micro and small enterprises protection and uh, uh, digital financial literacy. So we hope the discussion will be as lively tomorrow. Uh, in the meantime, I want to thank uh, all the speakers, uh, all the, the participants uh, for their attention. And we do hope uh, uh, all of you will be here tomorrow again to discuss together. Uh, for those here in presence, I will have a small announcement uh, as we close the connection. Thanks again and see you tomorrow. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow. Hello. <laughs> Thank you very much. So are we offline okay. or online? Then a small announcement for those are, who are here. Um, for those, I hope all of you who are joining us tonight, we will meet uh, downstairs 
at uh, 6.30 to go together. It's uh, just a few, minutes, a few minutes from here. But of course, uh, you can also go directly. You have indications, I think, in the leaflet.